Social innovation and development of ICT. Uh, I'm very, very interested in it, so let me just begin. So, the first question that I, I would ask rather like Dan is what do I do? Now, I do a lot of things, but here's a sample of things that are connected to computing. So, my main task is to do research, and I'm a maker of theories. That's exactly what I do. I'm a maker of theories. Theories about, over the years, I've made theories about data about programming verification, about various risk architectures, and also, uh, more recently in the last six or seven years, I've been looking at the way unusual physical technologies, quite different from silicon circuits and things of that kind, interact with algorithms to provide some sort of novel view on how computation works. So that's my main task, and I was very, very tempted to give a talk about that. Very tempting, right? But I don't know. I, I, I'll move on to something else that, that might interest you more. So, of course, in the modern era, everyone's a manager. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I should talk about management. And one of my tasks in uh, in the university is to manage a chaotic thing called high performance computing. High performance computing is nothing more than computing with very large, expensive, energy-hungry machines where you have very, very significant big problems to solve. And, and in the last few years, I've come to know an awful lot about that. But I'm not going to give a talk about that either. <laughs> These are all invitations, by the way, to be asked back in, in future occasions. <laughs> <laughs> so and then I thought, well, <clears throat> I'll go to my hobbies. I've got a lot of hobbies. If you're intellectual, uh, many of your hobbies are intellectual hobbies. So I have two intellectual hobbies to do with computing. One is investigating social aspects of the internet. And in particular, in the last few years, I've been looking very closely at surveillance, a very interesting subject indeed. So I thought, well, that, that's bound to go down well. But then I thought, well, maybe that's revealing too much. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about that. Right? <laughs> so what I am going to talk about is the historical development of computing and um, how, that, uh, how, how, how that works and what's going on here in the department and in the university. So I'm going to start off with some quotations that I, I read many, many, many years ago. And I've kept these quotations fresh in my mind. And they're from a poet called T.S. Eliot. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may have read him. In the 20th century, he rises high amongst poets of the English language. I would hesitate to say that he is head and shoulders the best. It's a bit difficult to uh, argue these things. And there are two things that I keep in mind when I think about what I'm personally doing in investigating the history of, um, of, our, of our field. Um, the first thing was in a poem in 1941 where he was meditating on life uh, and meditating on his experiences. And he simply said, well, we, we have the experience. The experience passed, and we missed the meaning of it all. And then later in life, we, we tried to approach the meaning. And by worrying about the meaning, we reinvented the experiences that we had. And they were different. Now, you have to see that in the context of the poem, but frankly, when you get to a certain age, particularly with technology like this, I thought, well, I want to know 
what on earth have I seen and what did I miss and I want to know this well right I just wanted to know all this um, I first entered the computer science department in the 1970s early 1970s and so I, I've seen a great deal and a lot of it has passed me by but a lot of it I've been in the thick of it so I love this quotation and the other one is a very important quotation from an essay he wrote about writers. Dead writers seem remote. Why do they seem remote? Well, because we know so much more than they ever did. But of course, what we know is precisely what they have given us. So I like that thing as well. So with those thoughts in mind, possibly um, it, it will register with you that when you do this kind of thing, it's more than an academic hobby. You, you somehow connect in a personal way. And with the history of computing, unlike the history of steam engine or the history of war, this personal thing is very, very interesting because, of course, the subject is essentially as long as one person's life. Okay? So there are plenty of people around, plenty of people around born in the 1920s. And if you ask what was then, what was now, you see the entire development of the subject from a standing start. Okay. Now, so what the heck is to be studied? So the historical develop his historical uh -huh. the <laughs> historical development of what? Well, it's really about the tasks and problems of the world and the world's work and the world's social life for that matter, particularly in these years, what people want to do and what data they want to collect. And over the period, these words completely change. So the word data, as I pointed out in my lectures to the second year, means something quite different now than it would have meant 10 years ago. Um, and of course, this is, if you like, the human side of it, the context of it, and we definitely want to study that. And then there is, of course, what you might expect me to be talking about, the hardware and the software. In fact, most people, when, when uh, they talk to me about the history of computing, they want to give me a laptop or some other machine. So the, the connection reduces very quickly to a piece of, of hardware. But computing is not about that. It's about this whole picture. So that's what the historical development um, has as its scope. So then comes the question, how does someone like myself or someone like you, as you get older, as you get more interested, as you have different encounters, how do you study something like that? Now you study for pleasure. Right? You can study for a job, but one studies it mainly for pleasure, to have a better understanding. Well, study is about thinking, cooking up some questions or reading questions, keeping questions in your mind, and try to answer them. And if you want to study the development of that circle of uh, phenomena, people, their problems, what data they were interested in, and then the hardware and the software and how it was created, then the best way is to go and talk to people, as well as read what other people have discovered. And collect stuff. But when you collect it, you've got to look at the material objects and think about what they are, what's their story. And those cabinets over there are all set up for some new exhibits. And the only reason they have lain, lain empty for so long is not that I haven't got the stuff, but it's the energy needed to write about them and catalog them before they go in, in, in the cabinet. And then what does one do? Well, as you gather your thoughts, you write, you give lectures, you publish, you appear on radio programs. So these are some projects that I'm involved in as my hobby. First of all, with Steve Williams, a friend of mine in ILS, we've created a university history of computing collection, and I'm going to tell you about that. There's a special theme that of interest to me because of my own research, and that I'm very interested in the development of formal methods for software engineering. That's exactly the sort of thing that Marcus was talking about. Where did all that come from? How on earth? Uh, uh, did all this rise up and find its, its feet in our technology. That's an amazing tale in itself. 
And then the other theme that I, I specialize in is the local history of computing. Now the local history of computing is just what's the story of computing in a region? For me, I say Wales, but I actually mean South Wales. When a person from South Wales says Wales, they mean South Wales, <laughs> right? When a person from Cardiff says Wales, they mean South Wales, but actually they mean Cardiff. <laughs> so as long as you know those things, you'll be fine, okay? So there are two questions. How did computers come to Wales? And how did big data come to Wales? And uh, these are the little things that one learns. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. So uh, this collection started in a sort of semi-official way in 2007, and it's, as it's a hobby, it, it, it tends to go in fits and starts. So we collect artifacts, machines, memories, cables. I have a giant collection of cables, totally anonymous. I can never find a cable I want when I need it, and I really need an electronic engineer who can spot a cable and give it its name. Ha! You've got so and so and so and so S. <laughs> and then sit down and make yourself comfortable because now you're going to find out about all the other versions of these connectors that pre existed. Anyway, so there's cables, fantastic topic. Um, software is much harder to collect. There's tons of it, but what the heck do you do with it? Archives, books, papers, memories, testimonies, videos, and audios. That's fun, that's talking to people. And then, of course, there's ephemera. And I want, with your permission and with your indulgence, to show you the sort of things that we collected. So here's an interesting artifact. This is in the room next door. So if there's third-year students, here you've seen it a lot. If there's second-year students, all you've got to do is blag your way into that room, uh, put on the light so that you can enjoy the artifacts, and you'll see this. This is all that's left of the very first computer Swansea University bought. It's an IBM 1620, a very primitive machine, but nevertheless one that uh, was quite influential in its day. So what is the story of the first computer that this university bought? Well, there's a big story, but I'm only got time to say a few words about it. Here are some close-ups. <laughs> it looks very sexy, and we put them, <laughs> we put them, we put them in the... Uh, in, in, in the brochures, right? But this one is particularly good. This is a, a warning in red that students touching this can lead to very expensive consequences. And that's because the machine was kept and gradually graduated into spaces where students were allowed. Originally, it had its own building by the arts hall, now demolished. Anyway, Principal Parry thought it would be great if we bought a computer in 1961. And IBM 1620 was being bought by lots of people. Uh, it cost £22,336. It didn't have hardware for adding up, but never mind. You know, it was IBM, and it was really cool in its <laughs> color. <laughs> in its color, right? What a color. Eh? And um, of that money, 12500 came from a public body called the University Grants Committee. And in fact, the argument was it was needed for simulating fluid problems. So it was the applied mathematicians that wanted this, and they got it. Well, that was great. There are lots of IBM 1620s around. There's a photograph of an IBM 1620 and textbooks on the IBM 1620, because in those days, when you learned programming, you bought a beautiful book, which was about programming a particular machine. Right? So there'd be one for the 1620, and then once the 1640 came out, there was another book. And anyway, they're all on display in the room next door, together with a photograph of the machine being used for newspaper typesetting. Anyway, it didn't last long. The bug had started, and soon £180,000 was produced to replace it in 1966. Now, you might like to ask, what could you buy for 22000 in 19? 61. Or what could you buy for 180,000 in 1966? Uh, these are big sums. And by the way, they needed a building and people, priests, to walk around looking after it, moving tapes and so on, and generally putting it to bed and drying their clothes because uh, <laughs> they were so 
hot. <laughs> there are other artifacts. This is your important programming uh, things. This is how you wrote a program. You do a, you do a flow chart, an international standard for flow charts. That's your stencil. You may have had chemistry stencils. This is one for flow charts. This is a special ruler. And this is a pocket calculator that does hex, made famous by the IBM 360 operating system, because anyone tinkering with that had to work extensively in hex, so it's helped that. So these are all in the room next door. Now, those are artifacts. There are dozens more of these things. What about archives? So here are some archives. Our collection here in Swansea has recently acquired a very large collection of papers and books by this very significant figure. Now, Comrie was a very major figure in scientific computation before electronic computers, right, before. And he had a huge effect on the standard by which <coughs> the calculations were made. He did all sorts of advisory work, very important in Bletchley Park, very important in the war effort, very, very important in the construction of mathematical tables, hunted down errors and so on and so forth. So he died in 1950, very early. But before, before he did, he pioneered the use of um, uh, hand calculators. And you see a wonderful hand calculator next door, very expensive room Ziga, um, in, in the room next door. So we've got a lot of his papers in the archives, but I think, oh, I don't know, how many meters it is? 20 meters of it, something like that. Very, very nice. We've got these recently, and uh, we're very happy about that. So this gives us a view of computation up to the dawn of digital computation. A very nice collection of this too. And this is what Comrie's world looked like. First of all, I would like to say this is a kind of parallel computation. Can you see it OK? All right. Everyone has a personal machine. And by the way, they're all women. That is how you did computations in the Second World War. What these ladies are doing are calculating ballistics on a massive scale. So that's, that's the world. And very, very carefully analyzed um, and, 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 and worked out. Another archive we were given is by a very famous software engineer called Dinis Pjörner. He gave us four boxes of amazing stuff coming from the Vienna lab in the late 60s, where IBM had a very important operation. And uh, Dinis is a picture of Dinis in my office, chatting away, telling stories <coughs> about the day. And uh, he's given us a, a, a lot of very valuable stuff. And in fact, some of it's very hard to get hold of. And here's some pictures. Um, this is Professor Mosses, you know him possibly in the department, and this is Professor Cliff Jones, who was coming down in order to find documents that he couldn't find, and we found them in Dennis's collection in our archive. These are, these, this is where we keep the papers. You see the shelves and things? And that's me looking at one of Comrie's um, texts. So it's quite an interesting thing to collect these archives. Very, uh, very important. Now, here's another important thing, software. Well, we've got a lot of software. But one of the things we're trying to collect right now is early Linux. And this is Alan. Many of you will know Alan. Particularly his sex. Um, lives in Swansea. When, and lived here for a very long time now. I was a student. And in particular, uh, became shot to fame, I would say, as um, a very influential figure in the development of operating systems. In particular, in the early 90s, because of his work on the Linux kernel. Uh, Alan has given us all sorts of stuff. He's given us all sorts of early, early Linuxes. He's given us Linux magazines. And he has even given this priceless commodity, the red hat that the Red Hat Company gave him, or services to the company, if you know about Red Hat software. So all this will end up in that cabinet sooner or later. And uh, this is exactly <laughs> what he did. And this is the very hat, right? <laughs> <laughs> in some German conference some years ago. And anyone who, who looks into the story of, um, of Linux uh, will, will find the effect of, of Alan in his early years 
was very profound indeed. So, oh, by the way, I must mention that the earliest implementation of Unix on a personal computer was by an electronic engineer called Steve Hosgood, who uh, lives in Bishop's and whereas he lived in Bishop's and he recently died this year, unfortunately. And um, Hosgood was a, a, a very interesting person. And uh, there were essentially three very familiar uh, efforts to put Unix, this fantastic operating system, onto personal computers. Uh, one was uh, Osgood's, which failed in a way because uh, didn't gather momentum. The other one was um, Andy Tenenbaum, who was a very important figure in computer architecture at the University of Amsterdam. But Andy made the mistake of wanting $100 for his system, and then there's minus 12 volts. Who, by the way, ha did not have a network version of, a working network version at all of Linux, and that's one of the things that Alan's often credited with, is making that thing uh, work on networks in the department. Anyway, the question about videos and audio, uh, audios illustrates the question about finding out what happened by talking. And uh, here is an attempt to answer the question, where did the first programmers in our region come from? And the answer is, as far as I know at the moment at least, the first programmers came because we were building a steelworks. It was a steelworks in Port Talbot. And it was a huge operation. And to design it, they started to use um, computers. And people would do all kinds of things. And I interviewed and taped John Dacey from Port Talbot, talking about the early 50s, where he came into becoming a programmer, and he would write his programs, get on a train, go up to London, run the programs in London, get the results, take the train back. It's interesting, that, isn't it? Don't underestimate it. If you want to put a high-definition video film in a cinema in, 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 I don't know, where, think of a place three hours away. London. Well, saying Swansea from London. Right. These files are so big, it's easy to put them on a motorbike and drive them here and download them. So we haven't quite escaped from uh, this sort of thing. Anyway, these things were going so well that programmers started to be hired in Port Albert to build the steelworks, and they bought their own Pegasus, which is a very famous British machine, in, in 1959. And it cost £50,000, so a lot of money. In. And of course, they had to build a building for it. So you know, this, is the, this is the way big projects work. And John is quite fascinating. He's a very clear thinker about what happened. And uh, there's an example of a Pegasus. There's <coughs> two I know, one in Manchester and also one in the Science Museum in London. The guy who restored the one in London is the guy that restored the Colossus in Fletcher Park. And uh, in particular, John would go up to Portland Place near the BBC to this lovely building uh, to learn programming in that room. And in fact, in, when the Computer Journal appeared in volume two in 1958, which was the British Computer Society's first attempt at publishing and disseminating new information, John had a paper in it about uh, simulating the behavior of the smelting shop in Port Albert. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you pull on this thread, you get a massive amount of information this is not straightforward. And so the local history is quite interesting. Here's another thing. I could go on forever on local history, by the way. But here's another one. Do you, anybody recognize this building? It is the DVLA in Morriston. Purpose-built building, built and ready for action in 73. And it's a factory for processing data. And uh, here it is. The data that you typically think of is this. But there's also the data about drivers. And actually, it's not a factory about processing data only. It is a factory for processing identities. The identity of cars, and the identity of people who drive. That's what it's for. Connected to the police national computer very early on in the 70s. By the way, that's where all the, uh, the identity cards come from. So if you are a foreign national and you've recently gained your identity card, it comes out of here. Okay. Because what goes on up there is nobody's business. And we all think of it as just driving. There's a lot more up there. 
a very interesting place. So that is big data. And here's a big story about that, which I can't tell you, but here is the new building, about about 75. And this is a, a massive, very important steelworks called Valindra. The steelworks have disappeared completely. I popped this in because when people in Swansea were learning how to make programs, because this operation was created by the Labour Exchange knocking doors in Sketty, saying, do you want a job? <laughs> do you want to come and work at the DVLA, or as it was then DVLC? It was on that level. So the people of Swansea have essentially populated and created this data. <coughs> the reason is, is that in the early days, people would be writing their programs down here, and a man called Tony Fitzgerald, who was one of the teachers, would get in his car at 5 o'clock and drive to here, where they had all the computers that they were waiting to have delivered to the DVL. <coughs> they would run the programs in the night, and at 11 o'clock, Tony would drive back with these corrected programs. So that is the way in which these things operate. Anyway, I'm nearly coming to the end. I've come to ephemera now. I said that these are the sort of things we collect. This is interesting. I collect all sorts of things, ephemera. Here's a bit of ephemera. This is a map. Now, once upon a time, there wasn't a Google or a Yahoo. So, um, you know, when, when one was going to surf, what one did was... Um, Get out a map on the internet. <laughs> well, darling, where should we go today? Where should we go today? Look at it. Oh, I don't know. I think the White House looks interesting. Oh, I went there last week. And so <laughs> what about Monash University Library? Ooh, I haven't been there. Where's Monash? Australia, almost. <laughs> okay, so that's what you did. You have your map. Okay, here's the map. The internet. <laughs> For hobbyists, of course. <laughs> and it's, of course, not the internet, it's the web. It's the internet, a la web. Now, this document is a wonderful document. It is ephemera, priceless ephemera, I would argue, um, because it was given free with an American publication to a hobby computer journal. There were lots of hobby computer journals, lots of them. And naturally, they would take an interest in the internet. So they gave a map for the readers to go and interest themselves in this. But if you look at a little corner of this map, devoted to Britain, it's quite interesting. Because that's Britain, there's Swansea. Swansea had a web page called Gower Surfing. <laughs> there it is, down here. And so that answers the question to some extent of how on earth did the web come to Swansea? And the answer is very simple. Dave Dunbar was a physics professor now, but was a, uh, a young lecturer at the time. He had uh, a visit, a sabbatical visit, to UCLA. That's the University of California uh, in Los Angeles. And um, the theoretical physics group there were being initiated into the web by the experimental part of the physics group. They're all part of the business, you see. That's the strong thing. And so that was all coming straight out of CERN, which is where the web was developed. So he sends all the software back to some PhD students in the physics department. They play around with it. They set it up. They get it working. So a lot of people get interested in it. And suddenly, Swansea was on the web. And we couldn't think of anything to put on it. Right? What can we put on it? Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> There's one with a surfer, right? And it was really very popular for a while. And in the Wayback Machine, I think you can find some of that stuff. Only much later did the university think this web could be useful for something else. Right? Now, this map also has got something else of interest for the, re the region, and that is if you look closely, and I'll let you find this, I'm not going to tell you where it is. Um, you will see the word Cardiff. All right. So, Swansea, Cardiff. And there, a the computer science PhD was interested in movies. Now, the internet was absolutely full of people listing information about their favorite movies. But of course, it was all downloaded by FTP and files and so on. And he built a web interface. 
for movie information. Okay? Right, you still call it. That is the international movie database. It developed, it grew, Amazon bought it. So whenever you want to look up who was in this picture or the story, so you want to make sure that you're not going to be disappointed by the ending of a film before you go and see it. This is exactly what I do, by the way. I don't want to spend money, good money, and a girl's going to die in the end. <laughs> you won't catch me in Noah, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, you look it up. I could look up this uh, person that you gave me uh, the other day, I think, in The Hungry Mountain or whatever it was called. It's from, right? Hungry Games, yeah, The Hungry Hunger Games, yeah. So you can look it up, but it came from hobbies, following their passions, right? Following their passions. So for heaven's sake, if you have curiosity, develop it. And if you have the thought of having passion about a topic, nurture it and be grateful that you have it. So that's that. And then finally, there's other ephemera. Uh, I have a complete collection of the magazine 2600 from 1980. Uh, what is it, 84 onwards. And 2600 is a magazine about hacking. And uh, it's for the first decade, it's about hacking phones, of course. 2600 is the sound wavelength that was found out to have access to operator modes on the American telephone system. So, And, and you got it by blowing a cheap whistle out of a uh, cereal packet called Captain Crunch. <laughs> and one of the early American hackers, John Draper, uh, took over the name Captain Crunch. So Captain Crunch has put the name in computer history, as well as in the development of cereals. You <laughs> 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 blew this whistle and down the phone, and suddenly you could screw the phone system. <laughs> or, or rather, explore, sorry, explore the phone system. <laughs> in the spirit of young, curious, <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, we have a complete collection. It's a fantastic magazine. I, I, I was going to bring one I forgot. Because, you, you, know, you know, it is fundamentally about phones, historically, but of course, long since abandoned that. It's all about hacking machines now. But all the tricks, you know, you know and, and the, so every time they get something new about a Mac, it's a big open thing. But they have kept up one tradition, and that is the pinup. Now, as you know, even with young people, you probably don't know what pinups are. But pinups are glamorous photographs put in a newspaper just to entertain the eye for a few passing seconds. Ephemera, if ever there was one. Right? The Sun newspaper used to have this on page three, and all sorts of other magazines do it in different or subtle ways. Okay? You know. Every single issue of 2600 has phones. <laughs> <laughs> phones of the world. Right? And there's some fantastic phones. There's like some, some kind of pay phone in downtown Kabul. <laughs> <laughs> Looking a bit worse for wear, let me tell you. Right? <laughs> anyway, so I, I like this photograph very much because it's, it's a little bit of a, a joke, you see. Obviously, you first think this is a, a picture of a, a magazine about babies and this young lady is reading this thing. Oh no, <coughs> not about babies at all. Okay, so that's my ephemera out of the way, and I want to thank you for indulging me with me taking too long. <laughs> That's all the talks for today. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we'd like to get any feedback from you again. Yeah, and obviously there's still plenty of food out there, so you don't want to waste food. <laughs> <laughs> Take the food. Everyone, you need the food. But now, we hope you enjoyed all the talks today, and obviously, like Dan said, we are very interested in your feedback. Obviously, we want to keep these talks going, and obviously, we have to do that without people getting back to us saying we like it. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. From my point of view, I'm ashamed I'm not staying in Swansea University because there's 10 more people after this coming.